His name is Shinomiya Hokage, a third-year graduate student who has always dreamed of surviving. One day, the entire school is suddenly ice kayed to a deserted island, and the story begins from here. He wakes up in a mysterious cave and meets some comrades who will accompany him in the future. Now, it's time for his survival knowledge to shine and be more useful than ever. He may be a bookworm at school, but he'll be a ruler in this world. Although surrounded by nature and monsters ready to devour him, he's determined to survive here. Currently, he's still just Shinomiya Hokage, a high school boy preparing for an upcoming exam. At this moment, the students in class are bullying Hokage as he's ranked last and undervalued. But that's okay because the school's discipline is strict, and they can't tease him for long. Then, he puts away his survival book and starts to drift into sleep, wishing for summer to come quickly so he can go on his desired survival tour. But, startlingly waking up, Hokage finds himself lying on unfamiliar ground, surrounded not by his classroom but by an alien landscape. Hokage slowly realizes that he has been reincarnated while sleeping and this is the place to fulfill his long-held dream. Standing up, he finds no signal on his phone, meaning he can't call for rescue. In his pocket, there are flares, but they are only to be used when he sees rescuers, and a handkerchief still wet from lunch. After taking inventory, he finds a knife, knowing this is a great opportunity to apply his lessons. With the day still young, he decides to scout the area for shelter. Venturing deeper into the forest, he encounters small animals like monkeys and squirrels, and dangerous ones like wild boars. Further on, he finds a suitable stream for a water source but knows he can't drink it directly. Hokage takes out three bottles he always carries for emergency water filtration and drinks. The water tastes wonderful, or maybe he's just very thirsty. He knows he must find a safe cave to establish as a base and use this stream as a water source before searching for food. Suddenly, Hokage hears human voices and meets a girl with a stunning figure from head to toe. After a loud scream, it turns out they are the top group from Class B, which Hokage is a part of. They were Yuki Mana, Futagawa Eri, Mimi Karen, and Nikitama Arisa. These were the same people who had bullied Hokage earlier in the day, so he didn't have a good impression of them. However, if Yuki started a conversation, these girls would definitely flock around him. Hokage, using his keen observation skills, a key skill for a survivalist, gathered information about them. Soon, the girls crowded around him, each vying to tell their story of how they ended up here and expressing their desire to follow him. Hokage could hardly believe he was talking with these girls. They guessed they weren't in Japan anymore, as it was impossible to lose phone signal there. After a thorough discussion, the five of them decided to head to the shelter, only to encounter a large tiger. Deciding it was safer to return to the stream than confront the tiger lying in front of the cave, they praised Hokage for bringing water filtration bottles and a dagger. They encouraged him to climb a coconut tree to take photos for surveillance, but a monkey unexpectedly snatched his phone. The monkey didn't run away but instead clung to Yuki. Eventually, after an embarrassing moment for Hokage, the phone was retrieved. Looking around, they spotted the sea in a distant island, hoping it was uninhabited and perhaps had some people on it. Following a compass, the group made their way to the beach, playing around but knowing they would have to return before dark. Hokage decided he must stand up and fight the tiger to reclaim the cave, he couldn't be bullied like this. Returning to the cave to confront the tiger was no easy task, so the girls were extremely fearful. After all, they were just schoolgirls who had been transported here without any experience. But now, it was crucial to unite and not let Hokage face the fight alone. Yuki, who had somehow learned to communicate with monkeys, befriended the monkey from the previous day and even named it Rita. Through the monkey, they learned that the tiger was still sleeping in front of the cave. Realizing this was their only chance, they cautiously approached the tiger, but it awoke upon hearing their footsteps. It would have attacked if they had run, but Hokage yelled, ordering everyone to shout loudly together to scare it away. Meanwhile, he used a flare to frighten the tiger, which fled in fear. The tiger wouldn't return for a while, afraid of things bigger and stranger than itself, like the flare's fire and their shouting. 
Hokage decided to check the cave first, and then they would all search for food, as they were very hungry. Someone suggested fishing, but it was too time-consuming, so they decided to temporarily rely on mushrooms. The group split up to gather wood and mushrooms, with Hokage and Yuki in charge of mushroom hunting due to his experience. Soon, they filled a bag with mushrooms but didn't return yet. The atmosphere made Yuki feel flushed, and Hokage accidentally stumbled and fell onto her. This unintended touch seemed appropriate for them to sit close together. Yuki leaned into Hokage, wanting to help him relieve stress and gratitude for leading the group. They shared a moment of bliss. Hokage hadn't expected this, but Yuki asked him to keep it a secret. Though unspoken, everyone knew this needed to be kept confidential, as long as Hokage promised to always protect the four girls, no matter what. Yuki then revealed that Hokage was the first man she had ever touched, asking him to appreciate that fact. They returned after their intimate moment, only to find a surprising scene. A crowd of people, all classmates from Class B, including the bullies, was in front of the cave. The bully approached Hokage, mocking his survival skills and saying they wouldn't mind if Hokage joined their team, which irritated him greatly. But before deciding to join the group led by Bayakuya, Hokage needed to consider their intentions and policies. Pressured by Bayakuya's gang, finally, his brother stepped in to mediate. This was Sumerejai Raido, the intelligent and charismatic twin of the infamous Sumerejai household. While Raido was known for his intelligence, his brother was equally notorious for his rudeness and craziness. Raido wanted to invite Hokage to his team, located on a distant mountain, as he had a sophisticated phone that could signal for rescue without needing a network. Hokage, thinking there were no more people on the island, decided to decline and stay in the cave, to everyone's surprise. The girls, trusting Hokage greatly, chose to stay with him, stunning the Sumerejai brothers who left in anger and embarrassment. Everyone knew this wasn't the time for conflict, so they endured each other's presence. After the Sumerejai brothers left, the group decided to quickly roast mushrooms for dinner. The taste was bland and unsatisfying, prompting Hokage to use his magic trick, actually just essential curry powder for any survivalist. Still too bland and quickly dissolving, they decided they needed to harvest salt from the sea by boiling the water. Exhausted after the day's events, Hokage prepared to sleep using his books as a pillow, unconcerned about the girls who went deeper into the cave for a bath. He just hoped they wouldn't waste any more paper or throw away the water bottles. The next morning, a frightening misunderstanding arose between Hokage and Arisa. Hokage woke up to find Arisa clinging to him in a compromising position, easily misconstrued. The other girls woke up, and Arisa, in tears, clung to them, claiming she had been taken advantage of. But after listening to Hokage's explanation, they realized it was a misunderstanding, leaving Arisa embarrassed and at a loss for words. With dawn breaking, they prepared to start a new day filled with more experiences and events. One of the new tasks the group of five undertook that morning was collecting stones and gathering survival supplies. Karen, showing her understanding, took the initiative to collect wood, knowing what Hokage was planning. Eri went to gather wood, while Mana looked for essential supplies, and Arisa, though not entirely trusted by everyone, decided to try fishing. Hokage wanted to use the collected soil and stones to make clay utensils for storing daily food. After gathering enough soil for Hokage, Arisa found his fishing rod and headed to the riverbank, excitedly but naively fishing without bait, which frustrated Hokage. As he watched her fish, unexpectedly, she caught a big one that dragged her into the water. Fortunately, Hokage quickly grabbed her, resulting in a compromising position. Initially, Arisa screamed about being assaulted, but then she understood the gravity of the situation and silently let him hold her. Safely back on the shore, they were surprised to find they had caught a large fish. Arisa wanted to grill it immediately, but Hokage insisted they wait for everyone to share the meal. She bashfully thanked Hokage for saving her, playfully suggesting that she was the one who wanted to be close to him. The feeling of being held by him from behind while catching the fish had left her quite flustered. Arisa boldly hinted to Hokage that if they ever returned to their old world, she would like to date him. They tacitly agreed to a date, 
the timing of which remained uncertain. Upon returning, Hokage taught the four girls how to make protective charms from poisonous mushrooms. He hung them on a string outside the cave to deter wild animals, as animals recognize mushroom toxicity better than humans. He then checked the pile of stones Mana had collected, and she had even sorted them by size. He was pleased with the prepared items and felt more hopeful about their survival. It turned out these girls were also diligent and had considerable survival skills. By noon, after a morning of hard work, the five of them sat around a campfire, grilling the fish. They ate together, but Hokage couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching them from afar. He hoped it was just his imagination and tried to immerse himself in the moment with the four talented and beautiful girls. After a hearty lunch, the four girls were still eager to work, undeterred by fatigue. They decided to split up to accelerate progress, with Arisi continuing to fish and Eri joining her at the riverbank. Karen, being knowledgeable, took on the task of finding clay and making pottery. Mana decided to stay with Hokage to help with gathering wood and crafting stone tools. Hokage was touched by the stones Karen had found and arranged, appreciating her trust in his survival skills despite her usual aloofness. He decided to use these stones to create stone tools from memory. The first thing he made was an axe, but his work was interrupted by Mana's presence, which made it hard for him to concentrate, a fact she quickly realized. Feeling a bit shy at first, she then decided to assist him with her skilled hands, though it got a bit messy with mud. Unable to bear the discomfort, Hokage pulled her into the cave to resolve this awkward situation. When they finished and the other three girls returned, they were impressed with the huge amount of work he had done. To them, Hokage was like a hero or a savior. Arisi then presented the fish she caught, offering one to each as a reward. Eri, who had been helping her, managed to distill a small amount of salt, storing it in a bento box brought from the other world. This harvest made their dinner even more delicious, partly because everyone was tired and hungry. Karen briefly mentioned that the weather here was stable and conducive to living, showing her intelligence and knowledge about the place. Hokage remembered that the absence of mosquitoes and crawling insects was a significant advantage for survival, as mosquitoes are responsible for many deaths annually. However, the problem of food preservation and bathing was a real concern for the girls. The next day's task would be to find a way to preserve food. Hokage planned to make soap for bathing, and he would think about a bath later. Suddenly, a beautiful girl approached, wanting to join their group. Her arrival caused Hokage to receive an unjust slap from Arisi. The girl expressed her desire to join Hokage's team and survive with them in this place. The girl who wanted to join Hokage was the beautiful senior, Asakura Miko. This revealed that not just those in their class were brought here. Miko also brought along her younger sister, who looked quite young. It turned out that the two sisters had also been transported to this place and had been observing everyone since the morning. Ready to contribute, they knew sewing and embroidery, skills they had learned in school. Initially, they planned to make simple clothes and later bedding, though it would be a bit time-consuming. Hokage wondered why Miko hadn't gone straight to the Sumerejai brothers' place. Logically, their place seemed more appealing and easier to find. Miko then calmly sat down and shared her story. She woke up in a cave and followed the Sumerejai's smoke trail, staying there for a while. However, she left due to inappropriate behavior from the younger Sumerejai brother. The situation escalated when he behaved inappropriately towards her little sister, leading Miko to decide to leave. The elder Sumerejai brother did not stop her, focusing on maintaining a society with rules, not chaos. She found their camp to be full of negative culture and upsetting scenes, prompting her to take her sister and leave, eventually finding Hokage's group. She was relieved and happy to see the harmony and unity among Hokage's group. Hokage saw this as an opportunity to weaken the Sumerejai brothers and divide their group. If Raido lost power, Bayakuya would take over their team. These were Hokage's careful calculations for the coming days. But for now, the girls were very excited about the new member. They offered Miko food, but only mushrooms were left, so she had to choose between curry powder and salt. The next morning, Hokage went to the beach, unexpectedly followed by Mana. 
It was their first time alone together, making them both shy, but Hokage had his plan. He removed his shirt, causing Mana to blush and shout in embarrassment. Surprisingly, he was only looking for seaweed. Mana felt a bit awkward and laughed. Hokage urged her to call her monkey to help them harvest seaweed. In her clumsiness, Mana stumbled and fell onto Hokage, resulting in an extremely embarrassing situation. In such a position, Hokage only felt weighed down. He asked Mana to get up as he couldn't move, making her blush with embarrassment. Despite being popular with boys in her previous world, her current behavior puzzled him. She decided not to get off but instead chose to steal Hokage's first kiss. However, when their lips barely touched, Hokage didn't react much, disappointing Mana. Annoyed, she initiated a more intense French kiss. Hokage's natural physiological reaction surprised her. Nevertheless, he kept his encounter with Eri a secret, not wanting Mana to know. Although she delayed his plans a bit, it wasn't a big deal, he could still get his tasks done. Seeing the seaweed and shells he brought back, the girls were thrilled about the change in their meal. They sensed something different about Hokage and Mana's return together but he quickly denied any implications. The attention then shifted to the mattresses Miko had made, placed inside the cave. Though not as comfortable as real blankets, being made from patchworked fabric scraps, they were still a great addition. Hokage checked the gathered fruits and vegetables, finding a toxic plant but also a rare fruit, likened to the ice cream of the wild. The seven of them quickly devoured the delicious fruit. Realizing the need for food preservation, Hokage considered building a house, inspired by ancient underground homes. His determination and creativity greatly excited the girls. They felt reassured in their choice of staying with Hokage over the Sumerajai brothers. The girls' enthusiasm boosted Hokage's confidence and motivation to work. As night fell, everyone was delighted to lie on the soft mattresses, all thanks to the hard work of the Miko sisters. Hokage laid down, mentally preparing for another challenging day ahead. If there were four seasons in this place, he knew he would have to prepare for winter. That night, everyone quickly fell into a deep sleep, unaware of the impending turmoil. In the middle of the night, Hokage loudly woke everyone up as a storm was approaching the cave entrance. He urged them to quickly save whatever could be damaged or swept away by the storm. The girls, having never encountered such a situation, panicked and wanted to flee outside, but he stopped them. It was too dark outside, and unknown dangers could be lurking. He instructed them to take essential items to the innermost part of the cave, where the incline would prevent water from reaching. At first, the girls were confused about what to take, some worried about their cosmetics, others about their heavy blankets. Hokage then firmly directed them to prioritize food and items that couldn't be salvaged if wet. To calm them, he used his phone's flashlight to illuminate their surroundings. He explained that not everything needed to be moved immediately, as the storm wouldn't hit them too quickly. After some chaos, the girls finally understood what was essential and managed to bring it inside. They all sighed in relief, thankful for Hokage's guidance. Hokage realized he now needed to prioritize creating a drainage system. The night's success was due to the girls' cooperation. If he wanted to lead them effectively, he needed to ensure their utmost safety. Everyone was exhausted and leaned on each other, falling asleep. Hokage, however, couldn't sleep easily, but suddenly, someone leaned against him and softly kissed him. He was cautious, not wanting to wake the others. Eventually, he gave in to the moment, comforted by the sound of the rain drowning out their whispers. Perhaps it was the darkness that allowed them to embrace each other like this, comforting and reassuring one another in these uncertain times. But unexpectedly, when he saw Karen's face clearly, he found her expression to be extremely perplexing. After the incident, Karen's face showed a strange expression, and she left without saying a word. Hokage sat still until the next morning, unsure of what to do. The next day dawned beautifully, and the girls seemed normal, with no unusual behavior. The cave still had water puddles, so they brainstormed ways to remove the dampness. Their morning task was to clean the cave to make it comfortable for sleeping again. Arisa and Mana were assigned to find food and cook, 
while Eri tried making soap for bathing. The Miko sisters continued creating clothes and fabrics. Hokage and Karen went hunting together, although Hokage knew it wouldn't be simple. Arisi playfully wanted to join, but Hokage refused, explaining that hunting here involved setting traps. While surveying, Hokage and Karen found rabbit tracks but also noticed wild boar footprints. Hokage decided to set a rock trap near the rabbit tracks, reasoning that if an animal had passed safely once, it would likely return. For the boar, he planned to create a spiked pit trap. After setting the traps, Karen remained silent, and Hokage, unsure if the previous night was real or a dream, didn't dare to say more. Karen then thanked him for his help the previous night, saying they wouldn't have known what to do without him. When Hokage was about to head back, Karen expressed her desire to visit a cave Arisa had mentioned and hugged him from behind, wanting to continue what started the night before. She had previously shunned such matters but now genuinely wanted to explore them with Hokage. She trusted him unconditionally and wished to proceed, but Hokage refused, citing the complications of potential pregnancy without safety measures. Suddenly, he pinned her down, but this time in response to hearing a tiger nearby. He instructed Karen to return to safety while he went to investigate. She warned him to be very careful as he quickly departed. Upon reaching a vantage point, he indeed saw a tiger, but it was being threatened by Bayakuya. Hokage realized that not just the tiger, but humans too, posed a threat. The real threat to Hokage wasn't nature, but the Bayakuya gang. From a vantage point, he watched as they cornered a tiger, driving it to madness and self-defense. Bayakuya used his followers as shields, sacrificing them to save himself. After a follower fell victim, he struck the tiger with a wooden spear, claiming victory. The tiger lay motionless at his feet, surprising everyone around. Bayakuya used this event to assert his dominance and satisfy his natural leadership desires. Hokage returned, knowing he couldn't let this situation continue unchecked. His followers were adapting to their environment, but they still needed to be extremely cautious. A slight miscalculation could lead to complex problems. Returning, Hokage saw Eri bathing Karen, who had gotten dirty. He asked about Arisa and Mana, who hadn't returned yet, and sent Eri to find them. Meanwhile, Miko approached him, wanting to take measurements for new clothes. However, her intentions seemed unclear as she continuously touched him under the guise of tailoring. They were in an intimate position when suddenly Miko's younger sister ran out from the cave, only covered by a thin piece of fabric, embarrassed to see Hokage. It was odd for Miko to be so close, as she was known to be distant and cold, often seen reading alone, like an angel in the other world. That evening, as Hokage recounted the day's tiger encounter, each person had different thoughts. Some believed Bayakuya killing the tiger was beneficial for them, but it wasn't the only tiger out there. Others feared what would happen if Bayakuya turned his spear towards them. His hierarchical system oppressed those below him, causing discontent but leaving them powerless. Hokage knew he would be at a disadvantage in a direct confrontation with Bayakuya. The girls were aware that if he came, there would be traps set around. Moreover, they were familiar with the terrain, providing ample hiding spots. Hokage realized he must devise a different strategy, as he couldn't let the situation continue as it was. Hokage had a brilliant plan that didn't require any preparation. The group moved towards the south, reaching the seashore. There, they found a cave overlooking the sea, picturesque and hard to detect. The Bayakuya gang was in the north, unlikely to discover this location. If the best way to avoid trouble was to flee, this was it. The cave was spacious and had nothing to complain about. The girls were delighted with their new home, preferring not to provoke confrontations. Moving was tiring, but with the help of the monkey and everyone's cooperation, it went well. They decided to call this place the Secret Den. That evening, they joyfully grilled the meat from a boar and rabbits caught in their traps, with Karen handling the cooking, albeit reluctantly when it came to the rabbits. Unable to consume all the meat immediately, they used sea salt to make some jerky. Mana helped by mapping the area and exploring it thoroughly. Hokage had chosen this place strategically, knowing it had a launching point for a boat to reach the nearby island and eventually Japan, 
forming part of his escape plan. The girls felt reassured and happy trusting in Hokage's clear and prepared plan. At night, Hokage took a torch to explore the area as Eri had suggested. He discovered a path leading to the beach but unexpectedly came across Miko. She was sitting under the moonlight, indulging herself, which embarrassed Hokage greatly. He tried to leave unnoticed, but she saw him and called out. Unable to refuse her, he approached, and they shared intimate moments, with Miko unable to restrain herself. Suddenly, she took out three figurines of wolves from her bag, expressing a desire to be with him, which further unsettled Hokage. But as they were getting carried away, a loud noise from behind startled them. It seemed that Hokage's loss of caution and vigilance had led them into danger. The noise turned out to be Tanaka Mantru and Kagiyama Hakumai, spies from the Sumerajai group. The girls gathered around, eager to punish them to extract their motives. Miko was particularly annoyed, as their interruption had halted her fun. The spies readily confessed everything, having already rejected the Sumerajai side and not wanting to return. The Sumerajai group was divided into various hierarchical levels, with these two at the bottom of their society. They had come here fleeing a horrifying story. Once, while recruiting more people, they found a group of exhausted teachers. The teachers wanted to take over leadership, but Raido would not allow it. Bayakuya declared that only those with true strength should lead. A tall physical education teacher challenged Bayakuya, seemingly having an advantage. Unexpectedly, Bayakuya pulled out a gun and ended the teacher's life with a single shot, shocking everyone around. Knowing that opposing the Sumerajai brothers would lead to a terrible fate, they decided to escape quickly, which is why they were here today. They pleaded to stay, regardless of the hardships, terrified of the gun, a weapon usually only held by authorities. Upon being allowed to stay, they joyously embraced Hokage, almost kissing him in their gratitude. They tried to learn how to make fire but quickly tired, annoying everyone. Miko coldly suggested leaving them in the fields to expedite things. Rita the monkey proved helpful in gathering fruits, so food was not a major concern. With things settling down, Hokage decided to make Sunday a day off. Everyone could relax and do as they pleased, as he had taken care of all the important matters. The two spies chose to practice football, while Arisa went fishing. Suddenly, Hinako approached Hokage, shyly asking for his help with a delicate matter. Later, they were seen at the cliffside, Hokage shirtless, and Hinako emerging from the cave, clearly embarrassed due to her scant clothing. Hokage and Hinako ventured into the sea without any clothes, which was not unusual for them. They climbed onto a round boat Hokage had crafted over time. Usually shy, Hinako had surprisingly asked Hokage for this favor. They rowed out to the middle of the sea, where Hinako revealed she wanted to go diving. She used to dive during summer vacations back home, and diving now could improve their fish and seaweed harvesting. Hokage was impressed by her initiative, already appreciating her sewing skills. Together, they dove underwater and collected a large number of clams and sea snails. The area's climate and environment were conducive to the growth of these large sea creatures. After getting back into the boat, they were in high spirits until Hinako spotted a shark in the distance. Panicking, she destabilized the boat, causing them to lose balance. Hokage tried to calm her, but she clung to him in fear, unintentionally pressing against him. Their struggle led to them falling into the water, with Hinako screaming in terror. To soothe her and avoid attracting the shark, Hokage held her close. Once she calmed down, he instructed her to swim back to the boat while he distracted the shark. Hokage swam close to the shark, which turned out to be a smaller fish-eating species, but he remained cautious. He managed to divert its attention and safely swam back to the boat, leaving Hinako in awe of his bravery. She had always relied on Miko, but now she found a new trust in Hokage. When they returned to shore, Barisa, who was fishing, wanted to join them on the boat. As Hokage helped Hinako out of the water, he greeted Miko, who was carrying some items. Afterward, Hinako apologized to Miko for something unknown to Hokage. Although he wasn't privy to their conversation, it seemed to be tense and difficult to resolve. That day was a joyous one for the group. 
The girls organized a running race with Mantru, who turned out to be surprisingly fast due to his high school track team experience. This led Hokage to assign him the task of scouting the Sumerajai team. Being inconspicuous and fast, he could escape if discovered. Tanaka, meanwhile, felt envious for not being given a similar task. He sat sampling Ares' salt-cured meat, finding it salty but far better than the dangerous food at the Sumerajai camp. Hokage gave Tanaka the task of finding spices and herbs to improve their cooking, which he happily accepted. According to Mantra's report, the Sumerajai group hadn't ventured south due to the abundance of animal tracks. However, a change in wildlife could complicate things. Karen, along with Mana, planned to communicate with wild boars to encourage their reproduction. Suddenly, rain forced Hokage and the two girls to take shelter in a nearby cave. Fortunately, there were dry wood and leaves left from before, allowing them to keep warm. Unexpectedly, Karen started to remove her clothes and then Hokage's in a natural manner, explaining it was to dry them. Mana was shocked, but Karen calmly said it was to prevent the clothes from getting wet. Karen then hugged Hokage to warm up, suggesting they rub against each other. She puckered up for a kiss to warm their lips, and Hokage couldn't resist. Mana, unable to stand aside, joined in quickly. The night turned into a sleepless one for Hokage with the three of them together. The next morning, when they returned, they found the two boys at home also sleep-deprived. Arisa rushed to Hokage, asking if he remembered their date, to which he said he did. However, he had urgent tasks that couldn't be delayed. Though disappointed, Arisa reluctantly agreed, curious about what was happening. At the Sumerajai camp, things were not going well as their daily activities centered around satisfying desires. Even Raito, the elder brother, couldn't stand it anymore and had to interrupt their indulgences to warn them about the situation. People had already lost their lives due to food shortages, so they were forced to stand up and gather provisions. The animosity between the two brothers was growing and directly affecting the team members. With this, Hokage decided to recruit more people from the Sumerajai group, expecting some would be in dire straits after the recent storm. Besides clothing, Miko also thought of making masks to prevent colds. If anyone showed adverse signs, they were to leave quickly. New recruits would initially stay in a secondary cave before Hokage welcomed them officially. The team split into pairs to search for members near the Sumerajai cave. Initially, Karen was teamed with Hokage, but Eri wanted to switch groups, claiming she didn't know the way. While the search was underway, Mana and her monkeys gathered additional food, anticipating the need for more with new members. The search began with the team spreading out from near the Sumerajai cave. Eri, paired with Hokage, curiously asked about his previous night. Hokage, unable to divulge the truth, lied that he was merely teased and then slept. Eri playfully patted his head before walking away, but suddenly, Hokage hugged her tightly. The hug pressed her chest against his head, leaving him unable to stay calm. They ended up engaging in more intimate acts skillfully. Eri sincerely complimented Hokage on his plans to return to Japan. Hokage felt conflicted, realizing he found this island life to be his paradise. In school, he couldn't adapt, feeling like an isolated island. Eri quickly apologized for her remarks, and they continued their journey. Meanwhile, a main used her tree climbing skills to approach a beautiful, delicate looking girl sitting on a large suitcase with an umbrella. The girl, reported by a main as a target, had moved as expected. Her name was Sophia Sama, a young woman whose lovely appearance seemed out of place on a deserted island. Mantra was carrying Karen on his back to scout the surroundings. However, due to the terrain's difficulty, he couldn't maintain his balance and accidentally let her fall. He was very keen on teaming up with Eri, as she was his ideal type with long hair and a pure face. Hokage was hiding Eri in nearby bushes after hearing some noises around. As he stepped out, a mane suddenly appeared and restrained him, tying his hands behind his back, leaving him unable to move. Although he held a dagger, he was in a dilemma and couldn't use it. He explained that he only wanted to have a normal conversation, prompting Sophia to approach and persuade a main to release him. After introductions, Hokage realized he was facing the daughter of the world's ruler. 
Sophia's father was the shadowy CEO of Microsoft, a leading global platform in search and applications. Amain, her personal bodyguard, explained her actions. Amain herself was an enigma, spotlessly clean despite the situation. She questioned why the group had moved their base. After Hokage's explanation, she found him to be very sophisticated, which prompted her to join his team, as she admired elegance. Hokage, helping Eri up, greeted everyone and the group quickly returned to their cave. Unexpectedly, Orisa was reluctant to accept the new members. Despite Hokage's persuasion, she angrily left without further discussion. Hokage found her sitting alone on a cliff, angrily staring at the sea. When he approached, she turned away in a huff. She felt insecure with the increasing group size. Everything was resolved after Hokage embraced her, and she broke down in tears, possibly revealing deeper feelings for him. The day ended with introductions of new members. Karen's team had recruited a muscular guy named Masuru Takahashi, who left Sumerajai's team due to a lack of protein for his muscles. Next was Mizuno Idaru, a Japanese swimmer, and finally, a lost, short-sighted young boy named Yashi Okada. The successful recruitment led to a joyful dinner, with everyone delighted by the hot, protein-rich food. Mizuno then spoke to Hokage about an island he had found. He proposed to swim there with some food reserves and return with news. His experience in long-distance swimming made him confident. Hokage had to consider this proposal carefully, as transporting everyone to the island by raft would be a significant risk. Everyone was lending a hand, doing their part in finding suitable roles for themselves. Mizuno, as planned, set off immediately, fearing that any delay would cause his body to become lethargic. Not only did Hokage provide him with food, but also a water purification bottle for the journey. If Mizuno didn't return within two weeks, they would switch to an alternate plan. After a heartfelt goodbye and thanks to Hokage, Mizuno quickly departed. Despite varying levels of productivity, everyone was eager to work. However, the shorter, less capable boy still struggled to keep up. People from Sumerajai's group, who were ill, began gravitating towards Hokage's team. Hence, it was crucial to be prepared and respond timely before this place was discovered. Today, Hokage decided to scout the hilly area and ask Domain for guidance, as she was more familiar with the terrain. Initially reluctant, wanting to stay and protect Sophia, Amain agreed to help after Sophia's insistence. She informed him about areas with hippos and leopards, and that the dense forest was a lion's territory. Her guidance gave him a better understanding of the island's geography, which was home to more animals than he expected, including some frightening reptiles. On their way back, Amain suggested visiting a particular place. She led him to a small cave covered in drawings, revealing it was where she vented her anger. Suddenly, she began undressing, proposing a training session with him. If he could restrain her by any means, he could do as he pleased with her. Initially overwhelmed and no match for her, Hokage, a mere survivalist, soon had an idea. He turned off the wall lamp, but a main confidently fought in the dark. As she approached to attack him, he suddenly turned the light back on. Blinded by the sudden light, a main lost control, allowing Hokage to tie her hands behind her back. Accepting her defeat, she agreed to let him do whatever he wanted. He kissed her and skillfully performed a few tricks, intriguing Amain. Hokage was also exhilarated by this newfound sense of conquest and possession. However, these training sessions were mainly to ensure Sophia's safety. They returned to the cave, but Hokage was still basking in the joy of the recent events. Although the island was deserted and seemingly advantageous, Hokage couldn't shake off his worries. Everyone was concerned about Mizuno but believed he would achieve something significant. Arisa happily showed off her catch, seemingly bringing back an entire ocean. She had caught a giant octopus which nearly overpowered her, prompting Hokage to jump in and rescue her. Thanks to muscle, the work progressed swiftly and efficiently. They even managed to build a grill in the cave, so Hokage decided to construct a shelter for the cave the next day. Suddenly, he noticed Mizuno whispering about something in the corner of the cave. He initially thought they had brought some shady material but soon discovered it was a solar-powered tablet. 
Hokage learned that Yashi Okada was a talented designer, knowledgeable in house design, and could help in building up the place. Hokage finally recognized Yashi Okada's potential. When Yashi Okada stepped outside, he was greeted by the girls showing off their gardening achievements. The plants and pots weren't large, but everyone was excited about them. Everyone wanted Hokage's praise, and during this, Mana returned with a rabbit fur, having taught Rita to produce these in great numbers. Mana hugged Hokage, asking for a leg massage after too much walking, but he excused himself and left. Sitting by the firewood, he pondered over the collected items and the idea of building a kiln with mortar. If the vegetable gardens thrived, they could start agriculture, perhaps even with the help of monkeys to increase productivity. Using metal tools could help in building houses and even forging a boat as planned. Suddenly, a maid approached, asking Hokage to come to her cave for a talk. Following her without suspicion, as his previous experiences there had been positive, Hokage entered the cave to hear a maid open up about her life tied to Sophia. Since childhood, she had been the fifth generation serving Sophia's family, always dedicating herself to their cause. She led him to a room inside the cave, piquing Hokage's curiosity. Inside, to his surprise, was Sophia, scantily clad, looking at him. Shocked and confused, Hokage thought to leave but was warned by a main that without her permission, no one could leave. Unable to exit, Hokage faced Sophia, who gazed at him with sparkling eyes. She admitted that discussing this directly was embarrassing, but now was her chance. Sophia expressed her desire for Hokage to be her life partner, leaving him momentarily stunned. He wondered if this was a trap, given his smooth journey in survival thus far. Now, feeling awkward about staying but unable to leave, he thought of a way to escape the situation. Seeing Sophia continuously trying to entice him, Hokage struggled to remain calm. Amain, noticing the delay, rushed in to help Hokage out of his clothes. Fortunately, Hokage regained his senses just in time to stop things from going further. He knew he was lucky, but something felt off about the situation. The bed and mattress, meticulously made by Miko, were surrounded by scattered flower petals, and there were even three wolves prepared in advance. Hokage swallowed hard at the sight but couldn't just close his eyes and go with the flow. He asked Sophia why she was doing this, sensing there was a special reason behind it. It turned out that she was once a treasured princess to her parents but merely a pawn in their plans. Admired by many but always following her father's orders, she was destined for an arranged marriage to benefit their business. She had managed to escape, changing her name and enrolling in the current school, which is why no one knew she was the daughter of a powerful family. But her time of freedom was ending, and she would soon have to return to her predestined life. She wanted to give her first time to the man of her choice, Hokage. Hearing this, Hokage immediately declined, leaving both girls stunned. He understood her desire for freedom but knew this wouldn't give her what she truly wanted and could bring shame to her family. Hokage, empathizing with her feeling of not fitting in, advised Sophia to find an activity that made her feel free. If she still had feelings for him afterwards, they could talk, otherwise, it was best to let it be. Leaving Sophia in tears, Amain stayed to console her. Hokage left, feeling regretful but firm in his belief in freedom. The next morning, everyone went to the stream for fishing and fun. Seeing Sophia laughing and enjoying herself with Hokage, he felt somewhat relieved. He made a fishing trap for the girls to catch fish more conveniently and watched everyone from a distance. Mana sat next to him, touching his arm in a suggestive manner. Suddenly, she turned to him and asked if he had been intimate with another girl, causing him to choke on his drink. Mana, seemingly eager to know, persisted in asking Hokage about the previous night. She was curious because she noticed Sophia's unusual behavior that morning and the fact that Hokage hadn't returned the night before. Hokage explained that he did stay with Sophia, but nothing happened between them, he swore. Before he could elaborate further, Mizuno suddenly appeared from the bushes, exhausted, announcing that he had found cows. Not just any cows, but dairy cows, and he had left Yashio Kata to watch over them while he returned to report. Hokage, 
thrilled by this news, decided to go find these cows. Amain, with her knowledge of the area, led the way with Sophia. Hokage would go with Eri and Mana to search together. However, on the way, Eri's shoe broke, slowing her down. Since they were not near Sumeraji's cave, she told Hokage to go ahead without worrying about her. Meanwhile, at Raido's cave, things were becoming increasingly dire as a flu outbreak escalated rapidly. The infected lay motionless like corpses, and no one dared approach them. A girl with thick glasses rushed to inform Raito about the situation. Their medical teacher had abandoned them, leaving Raito to handle everything. Their food supply was also dwindling, so Raito decided to seek out Bayakuya to resolve the food crisis, not wanting to fall ill himself. Mana and Hokage walked for a long time without finding the cows and decided to rest while waiting for Eri. They regretted not asking Mizuno about the cow's location or how far they had to travel. During the rest, Mana asked Okage about earlier, knowing that everyone probably liked him. She acknowledged his intelligence and skill, which would naturally attract others. However, she wanted to monopolize his attention for a while, letting him rest his head on her lap. They shared a kiss, only to be unexpectedly caught by Eri, who quickly left, embarrassed. Both knew that Eri also had feelings for Hokage but always put others first, reluctant to express her own feelings because she knew Mana liked Hokage too. Suddenly, Mana called out to Eri, inviting her to join them in a situation that was becoming increasingly complicated. In this situation, Hokage found himself between two girls, unsure of what to do next. The two girls, oblivious to Hokage's discomfort under their tight embrace, were engaged in their own world. Despite everyone's apparent affection for Hokage, the real question was whom he truly liked, as it seemed everyone had feelings for him. The girls even started comparing their assets in a chaotic manner, leaving Hokage feeling like he was in the middle of a survival battle he couldn't escape from. He was helplessly used as a plaything between them. Eventually, after a competition to see who could please Hokage more, the girls came to a compromise, agreeing to share him, as things on this island couldn't always go as one wished. Hokage was content and pleased with the peaceful resolution of events. The moment was interrupted when Mana suddenly screamed because Hokage had supposedly touched her inappropriately. However, upon closer inspection, they realized it was actually one of the dairy cows they had been searching for, curiously observing their intimate moment. Not just one, but three cows, likely a family. Seeing the cows with plenty of milk, presumably having recently given birth, Hokage decided to lead them back. Mana, having already befriended the cows, prepared to return with them. Suddenly, a hen appeared overhead, and soon after, a flock of chickens emerged, gathering around Mana. Her skills in farming and animal husbandry were unmatched. Today was a day of abundant harvest for Hokage in every aspect, despite being overwhelmed twice. His area was projected to become a large farm with a variety of fruits and animals, providing milk and eggs. The three of them returned happily, having resolved their differences. Meanwhile, in Raido's camp, a scantily clad girl lay on the ground covered with leaves. The ongoing food shortage was becoming critical, and even Raido, the leader, was at risk of starvation, let alone his followers. He could no longer delay discussing the situation with Bayakuya. The atmosphere in Raido's camp was starkly different from that in Hokage's cave, suggesting something significant was amiss. This morning, everything seemed renewed as everyone was awakened by Mana's calls. She had found a large number of eggs from twenty hens and prepared a lavish breakfast. Everyone enjoyed the meal and was excited about the cow's milk, but Hokage cautioned that the milk, being unpasteurized, could be harmful and should not be consumed yet. Suddenly, Eri's mention of rice sparked an idea in Hokage's mind. Meanwhile, at Bayakuya's camp, frustration was mounting as they ran out of meat, left only with small bones, mushrooms, and leaves. Annoyed, Raido arrived to drag Bayakuya out, insisting they search for food. Initially resistant, Bayakuya realized his disadvantage and reluctantly agreed to set out with his spear in search of provisions. He decided to explore the northern region, an area he hadn't visited before. 
Hinako cheerfully approached Hokage to show him the mattress and blanket she had made. Hokage accidentally mentioned seeing something similar at Sophia's place, hastily complimenting Hinako to cover his slip-up. Hinako was delighted with the praise, and Hokage felt relieved that she was talking to him. It turned out Hinako had been picking cotton and using Sophia's clothes to make these comfortable mattresses. Lying down on them, Hokage quickly fell asleep, only to be woken up by Miko lying beside him under the blanket. Overcome with emotion, he buried his face in Miko's chest, marking the second time they had been alone together since the moonlit night. Suddenly, Hinako, unable to find her sister, decided to lie on the bed by herself but was surprised to find her sister and Hokage under the blanket. Fortunately, she didn't overthink it, while Hokage cleverly diverted the conversation to Eri's broken shoe. Finally, Miko and Hinako left to find shoemaking tools, leaving Hokage to his own devices. As he stepped outside, he saw Eri holding a basket of beans, planning to make fermented food and spices. With Mana and Rita busy training at the farm, Hokage had no company until Karen, hiding behind a tree, decided to join him. She wanted to spend time alone with him, but their plan was thwarted when Arisa, not fishing that day, excitedly joined them, dampening Karen's spirits.